We're trying to make the Meeting House Lecture Series free and open to the public, but if you'd like to support it, I saw many people gave gifts on the way in, you can leave a gift. We also have cards back there with a QR code on it. If you'd like to do an online donation, that helps us. We want to keep doing this, in other words. And uh, we started it by just asking our committee members to each give $100 each to help make a pool of money to start with. Um, but your support is greatly appreciated. There are also books on the table in the back. I saw they were kind of running out. But if you want to sneak back there and buy one from Maryland, they're $20 each. But those are, his books are freely available, not free, but available on, uh, on Amazon or anywhere you can buy a book these days. I'm sure you can get it. It's a, I've, it's a really good book, and I'm really excited to have Philip here with us uh, and hope that um, we have an engaging night. At the end of the time of his lecture, he'll answer questions. I'm going to share this microphone. I would just ask that we do one question each so that uh, multiple people get a chance to ask a question. Um, so let me turn the mic and the stage over to Philip and just give thanks again that you're here with us tonight. Well, thank you so much, Doug, and uh, thank you all for coming out on uh, this sort of late summer slash early, early fall evening. Uh, it's really, really a pleasure to be here in such a storied church and such a such a storied, storied community, um, which uh, whose history intersects um, at multiple points with, uh, with the story that I'm going to tell you tonight. So I'm sure you've all seen photos like this, um, photos of the failed coup attempt on January 6th of 2021. And perhaps you also noticed the strange jumble of symbols in the photos. You've got Christian flags and Jesus banners, um, but also Confederate flags and a wooden gallows, uh, stars and stripes, don't tread on me flags, and of course, lots and lots of Trump flags as well. A lot of uh, secular observers were, I think, surprised by uh, this mix of symbols. They saw apples and oranges, things that didn't go together, uh, in their minds at least, symbols of religion and nationalism, racism and vigilantism, libertarianism and authoritarianism. But uh, what Sam Perry and I saw was a kind of toxic fruit cocktail, what we call white Christian nationalism. And my talk today is uh, based on the book that we were writing, in the middle of writing, in fact, at the, at the time of, of the failed coup attempt. Uh, the book is in four parts, and my talk will be two. First, I'll talk a little bit about what's in the fruit cocktail, the, uh, the ingredients and who's drinking it. And then I'll talk about uh, the original recipe for the cocktail and how it's changed over time. Third, I'll focus on its effects on our politics over the last decade or so. And then I'll conclude with some reflections on where uh, Christian nationalism is headed today and what can be done to, to counter it. So let's start with the, the what question. Just what exactly is white Christian nationalism? What we're thinking about, about it is as a political vision. Uh, in social science speak, uh, a set of attitudes and preferences about politics and policy, kinds of things that we can pick up um, if we do a, a, a public uh, opinion survey. And in fact, that's exactly what my co-author, Sam Perry, uh, who is a survey researcher, has done. Um, in fact, uh, put together um, a measure of Christian nationalism based on a, a series of questions that were asked in a survey that was originally fielded in 2007. And you know, people can agree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree, and you sort of assign points from zero to four, depending on how people answer the question. Uh, you add those points up and you get a kind of a scale, like a measure of uh, the degree to which people uh, embrace, embrace Christian nationalism. Um, in a study that was released a few months ago, um, Robert P. George um, of the Public Religion Research Institute, um, which has been working on this question for a while, uh, constructed a similar scale using even more 
targeted question uh, to see if the, if the result was different, to see if some of the findings were really just you know, an artifact of the kinds of questions that we asked. Uh, but it turns out that they're not. The results were surprisingly similar. Also, one of the, the things that uh, is helpful about a survey is it kind of helps you to answer the how many question, right? You kind of, you know, it's one thing to know, well, you know, there are some folks out there who believe this and that, but how many of those people are they? Um, and who are they? So um, in an earlier book uh, with Andrew Whitehead, Perry divided up uh, the survey respondents into four different categories based on uh, their score on this Christian nationalism scale. And they found that almost half of Americans partly or strongly affirm Christian nationalism. Um, Jones comes up with a somewhat lower estimate of about 30 um, percent. And um, here you can also see that there are uh, you, uh, four different categories there in that left-hand slide. People who completely reject it on one extreme, people who are ambassadors for it on the other, and people who um, are somewhere somewhere more, more in the middle. Um, you can see that uh, about one in five people, one in five Americans, really strongly embrace uh, Christian nationalism, and uh, you know roughly the same number, a little over 20 percent, um, are categorized um, as as resistors. Um, and uh, Robbie P. George uh, divides things up a little bit differently, but um, you still can see that there's a you know pretty substantial number of Americans who really strongly embrace. Uh, Christian nationalism, somewhere between 20, 20 and 30 percent. So one objection that I often hear when I speak to public audiences about this is like, you know, this white Christian nationalism just sounds kind of like a slur, right? I mean, you know, aren't you really just trying to sort of paint uh, anybody who's a, a conservative white evangelical as, you know, a bad, as a bad person, as, as an evil person? Um, I mean, I think the important thing here to understand is that while there's certainly uh, overlap, right, between uh, conservative white evangelicalism and white Christian nationalism, they're definitely not identical, right? I mean, there are uh, conservative white evangelicals who are very firmly opposed to Christian nationalism. You can see, like, you know, about a third, in fact. And then there are people, um, you know, who also embrace... Uh, Christian nationalism across to one degree or another across a bunch of other religious traditions. So uh, white Christian nationalism is not just another word for uh, white conservative, white evangelical. Uh, this is really a kind of an ideological movement that runs across um, a bunch of different traditions uh, and quite amazingly uh, also includes uh, increasing numbers of folks uh, who aren't religious at all. Um, and this is... Um, finding by a uh, political science named, scientist named Brian Burge, who teaches uh, in my home state uh, of Illinois. And he was digging through the data and first discovered something that just seemed really bizarre to him. Uh, he would find people who would say, uh, I'm Catholic and I'm evangelical. Uh, it seems a little odd. You know, they're like charismatic Catholics. Maybe that's what they're, taught, that's what they're saying. But like, what about the like Hindu evangelicals or the atheist evangelicals, right? Small numbers, but this was sort of a, a clue uh, to him that uh, for some folks, evangelical was not really a religious label anymore so much as a political or ethnic or tribal label. You know, by saying I'm evangelical, I'm telling you something about my politics and telling you something uh, about uh, about my cultural cultural identity. Um, all right. So with all that uh, with all that in mind, what exactly do white Christian nationalists believe? What is this political vision that I mentioned a little bit earlier? Uh, well, obviously they believe that uh, that America is a Christian nation, or at least it was, and that it should be again. But what else? Well. They believe in a strong military, they support the police, they want law and order, but they also oppose gun control, and they're against government regulation, including mask mandates and vaccination requirements. But on the other hand, they're also for free market capitalism and against government handouts, at least to other people. I mean, that's not so surprising in a way, right? Um, you know, I mean, this 
to a lot of uh, you know conservative Americans, you know that would be not a bad description of their of their of their, of their political beliefs. But the, what does this have to do with Christianity, right? What does this have to do with with Christianity? Because you know, kind of the, the the amazing thing is that um, you can statistically control conservative ideology for religious belief, for church attendance, on and on and on, and you'll find that. All these things uh, are strongly correlated with white Christian nationalism, even when you control for all those things. So that tells you that um, when you're, you, if insofar as uh, like this lines up with conservatism or this lines up with uh, with with church going, that's not really the underlying cause. The underlying cause is is white white Christian nationalism in many cases. Um, so what though does this have to do with Christianity? Um, certainly there are many uh, conservative white evangelicals who will insist that really all of this just is part of, uh, of a biblical biblical worldview. And I imagine, you know, uh, folks driving around, you know, you've seen bumper stickers and, and, uh, and signs like this. So, um, you know, whether or not you think this is Christian, it certainly is something that a lot of people who understand themselves as Christian identify with and affirm. So why are we calling it white Christian nationalism, right? What does this have to do with race? Well, um, the reason is, is fairly simple. Um, it turns out that Christian nationalism is pretty strongly associated with a bunch of different indicators of animus and opposition to non-white immigration, and also with a very strong sense of racial grievance and white identity. It is a, a combination uh, of religious and racial identity. And where you can really, really see this most clearly is if you compare black and white Americans. So there are, there are a lot of uh, black American Christians who actually will score pretty high on the Christian nationalism scale. You know, they think America should be a Christian nation. But this means something very different to them. Um, what it means to them is that this should be a country that lives up to Christian values, uh, equality, freedom, inclusion, justice. Uh, it does not, it, it means something more like uh, what uh, you know, being a Christian nation would have meant, for example, to Martin Luther King or somebody uh, who was a civil rights leader. Um, so it has a has it means something really very different uh, to them. Okay, so that's that's my first pass on the what question. So let's turn to the when question, um, and that is that is when did white Christian nationalism first emerge? Um, you know, this term Christian nationalism is one that nobody was really using outside of a seminar room until about five minutes ago. Yeah. Seriously, I mean, I, I mean, I can remember, uh, you know, uh, like doing seminars and this like 10 years ago and I would have colleagues who, you know, kind of work on nationalism. Say, That's just not a thing. I mean, it doesn't, it can't really exist. Nationalism is secular. What do you mean by Christian national? I'm like, well, I, I think this is a real thing. Um, and, um, but this is not something that's new. Like some folks use white Christian nationalism sort of interchangeably with, you know, the Christian right or just, you know, as a kind of epithet, like people I don't like, people I disagree with. Um, but if you really understand this as, a, as an ideology, as a set of ideas, as a vision of what America is and should be, then the answer to the when question is not 2016, it's not, 19, not 2000, it's 1690. Uh, so really, uh, this, is a, this is the place where the story that I want to tell you starts to intersect uh, with the story of places uh, like Longmeadow, and for that matter, uh, even more in some ways, New, New Haven, Connecticut, where I live. So uh, I said one way of talking about white Christian nationalism is like a political vision, but another way of thinking about it is, uh, is what I'm going to call a deep story. And that story goes something like this. America was founded as a Christian nation. Founders were Orthodox Christians, whatever that means. The founding documents are based on biblical principles, 
maybe even divinely inspired. America is divinely favored, hence its power and prosperity. But America is threatened by non-white, non-Christians, non-Americans on its soil, on its borders. So it must be kept white and Christian or made so by whatever means necessary. So um, for some Americans, the story is really quite explicit. I mean, if you crack open the history textbooks that are used by many Christian homeschoolers, you'll find it right there in black and white. And if you're not a reader, you can always get a ticket for Michael Flynn's uh, revive, one of Michael Flynn's uh, Reawaken America rally. But for others, and I think really for, for many, uh, the deep story remains implicit. I mean, this is one of the ways in which uh, you know, why we use the term deep story. It's not something that, you know, is completely conscious, that, uh, you know, that people go around thinking and talking about. It's just kind of, if you press them, though, it sort of feels true. It just feels like this is, you know, America was founded by people like me and kind of belongs to people like me. And, you know, if people like, people like me, unlike me, are trying to take it away from that, in a way, really is, is the story. I think it's important to, then to see the way in which the deep story and the political vision, though, are connected with each other, right? Remember earlier on, I was talking about, you know, these different views about whatever, you know, guns and the military and the welfare state and so on and so forth. And like, what does that have to do with Christianity after all. I mean, I thought, you know, Christianity was about, you know, loving your neighbor, wel welcoming the stranger, not throwing stones. You know, it doesn't seem at first glance terribly, terribly Christian, at least on one understanding of what Christianity is about. But this deep story really holds the different parts of the political vision together. It explains how and why religious and racial and national identity go together with each other and also with things like support for free market capitalism and gun rights. So as I said, the deep story is an old story. In a sense, it's really as old as the Christian Bible itself, or at least a certain Puritan Protestant reading of the Bible. Uh, to be even more specific, three readings of three different stories, which we call the promised land story, the end time story, and the racial curse story. So the promised land story is the idea that the English colonists, later uh, American settlers, were a new chosen people, the successors of the ancient Israelites, and that North America was in fact, their promised land, which uh, God had given to them, which they were entitled to. Um, and those folks who were already on that land, you know, the various Native American tribes, were kind of like the biblical Canaanites and Amalekites. So, you know, if you know those stories, you know what happens to the Canaanites and the Amalekites. It does not go, go well for them. That's, you know, all this smiting and thrusting uh, and so on um, that, that you hear in the, in, in, the, in the biblical account. And so really there was this, this sense that um, we, the chosen ones, are entitled uh, to take this land and to conquer it um, if, if necessary. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the promised land. And it goes with the idea that those others, Native Americans or later uh, Mexicans, uh, or immigrants are literally demonic others. Um, like, not just, you know, demons in the metaphorical sense, but like, really, in the literal sense, demons. The second story is, uh, is the end time story. Uh, I imagine this is, some version of this is familiar to all of you out in the audience. Um, this is a certain interpretation of biblical prophecy uh, that we find in the book of Daniel or uh, the book of book of Revelation. This is the idea that um, uh, that Christ will be returning soon to the earth, 
um, and that the second coming of Christ will go together with a kind of epic battle between the forces of, of good and evil, um, natural and, and supernatural. So this is like a very literal reading um, of, of, the, of the book of Revelation, right? This is, uh, you know, Jesus is literally going to come on a white horse. He'll literally have uh, a sword coming out of his mouth. There will literally be uh, river, rivers of blood and avenging, avenging angels. The, the third uh, story is uh, what we call the racial curse story. And this is uh, a story that um, comes together really to provide a biblical justification for uh, the kidnapping and enslavement of, uh, of Africans and others in uh, bringing them to uh, then becomes the United States. And uh, this goes back to another uh, story in the Hebrew scriptures um, about Noah's sons, one of Noah's sons seeing him drunk and naked in his tent. Noah curses him um, and uh, uh, places a curse not only on him but on all of his descendants, that they will have a mark on their body and that they will be uh, condemned to serve others. Well, you probably already can kind of anticipate the twist that's given to the story, what is that mark? That mark is blackness. And what is that uh, servitude? Well, that servitude is enslavement. And so um, this suggests, uh, and this is how it was understood, that, uh, that uh, all Africans are basically uh, under the curse of Cain and um, have warranted uh, the kind of servitude that they've been uh, that they've been subjected to. All right. So, um, by 1690, all three of these ingredients of white Christian nationalism were ready to be mixed together by Protestant theologians. And I would argue, we argue in the book, that the original mixologist was none other than Cotton Mather. Uh, third in the line of famous Mather preachers uh, just just a bit east of here um, in Cambridge and, and, and in Byron. Um, and this ecclesiastical history of New England, uh, which, uh, which he wrote a very, very famous book, uh, still read and studied by many American historians today, uh, really brings together all three of, of these elements. Uh, the justification for slavery, the idea of the Puritans as a new chosen people, uh, and of New England as their as their promised land, and also uh, with a, a kind of apocalyptic prophecies of which he was a he was a particular aficionado. So really, um, this is kind of the ur text of white Christian nationalism. Now, um, like other fairy tales, uh, the deep story has been told and retold over time, and comes in many different versions. Who counts as white has changed over time. You know, Irish and Italians didn't used to count as white 150 years ago. Jews certainly not. Also, who counts as Christians? Are Catholics Christians? You know, a lot of Protestants didn't think so. Who counts as a as a real American? Um, and if you're interested, we uh, we try to trace uh, in our book the flag and the cross to try trace of these changes uh, over time. But let me now go to the, the third question, which may be, in a way, the one that uh, feels uh, most immediate and most important today, which is the how question. Like, how does this work, right? So how does this actually work itself out in our, in our politics? Well, here's how it works. Uh, when white Christians make claims on other Americans, they do so in the name of national unity and solidarity. But when racial and religious others make claims on them, they are refused in the name of individual rights and personal accountability. In other words, heads white people win, tails everyone else loses. Um, in a phrase, freedom, order, and violence. Now, this is what Perry and I call the holy trinity of white Christian nationalism. So freedom and rights for people like us, 
order for everybody else and righteous violence against anyone who steps out of line. That's the Holy Trinity. So let's take a quick look at contemporary politics to see how this can work. So you might remember the Tea Party. It started um, in February of 2009 when Rick Santelli, a financial reporter with CNBC, delivered a violent rant from the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. He blamed the 2008 financial crisis on losers who had taken out mortgages they couldn't afford and excoriated America's first black president for bailing them out. He then called for the formation of a new Tea Party to resist federal taxation and defend individual rights. So at first glance, this sounds libertarian. You know, it's just kind of free market libertarian. But here's the thing. As um, academics and journalists began digging a little bit deeper and trying to figure out who the Tea Party supporters were uh, and the organizations that they were forming, they found that most Tea Partiers tur turn, uh, turned out to be older white evangelicals. And they also found that well-known evangelical political activists like Ralph Reed were centrally involved. Not only that, it turned out that religion was mixed up with race. Tea Partiers were strongly opposed to non-white immigration. In fact, some of the early Tea Party groups in Texas, for example, emerged out of white vigilante groups patrolling the southern border. OK, so let's shift our focus now to uh, a couple of decades or so later to the MAGAverse. Uh, you might remember in his 2017 inaugural address, President Trump promised, quote, that the American people would take back their country. They would band together around Christianity. They would start winning again and saying Merry Christmas again and bring Christianity back because it's a good thing. They would also put America first, restore law and order, build a great wall around the nation to keep out criminals and illegals, and they would institute a total ban on Muslims. I mean, it sounds a lot like white Christian nationalism, right? And indeed, this is one way of understanding Trumpism. It's not the only one, but it's one way of understanding Trumpism is as a reactionary and secularized version of white Christian nationalism. It's reactionary in the sense that it abandons the, the polite rhetoric of colorblindness and American exceptionalism and takes up a full-throated racist language about blood and violence. Uh, I mean, it's really two, hardly two topics uh, or that, uh, that Trump likes to talk about more besides blood and violence, right? Um, it's also secularized in the sense that it's not really apocalypticism in the biblical sense, just catastrophizing in a kind of a general sense, right? So good and evil are replaced by friend and foe. But just as the Tea Party's libertarian facade hit white Christian nationalism, so too does Trumpism resonate with the holy trinity of white, white Christian individualism, freedom, violence, and order. First, violence. And we all know that Trump is a master of verbal violence. He uses words as weapons to wound his opponents and intimidate his rivals. Crooked Hillary, Sleepy Joe, Lion Ted, Little Marco, Low Energy Jab, probably forgot a few. Uh, and of course, he's not above threatening or inciting physical and violence. Uh, he did so repeatedly on the campaign, campaign trail and most consequentially on January 6th. Um, so what about freedom? When criticized for his intemperate speech, the insult, the threats, and the profanity, uh, Trump styles himself as a defender of free speech and his opponents uh, as, and an opponent of cancel culture who dares to be politically incorrect. In other words, he claims the God-given right to use racist and sexist language with impunity, as in the good old days of Jim Crow and Mad Men. Finally, order. By which I mean first and foremost racial order. Trump's response to Black Lives Matter was to call for law and order, which is to say white male violence, police violence, vigilante violence, even military violence, we all know that he wanted to call out the National Guard. Meanwhile, his response to white male violence were unrepentant words 
about very fine people and patriotic Americans and people who are just on a tour visit to the U.S. Capitol. So let me conclude um, about with some thoughts and worries about where white Christian nationalism is headed. The short answer is in an increasingly anti-democratic and radical direction. Though paradoxically, maybe, maybe, in a somewhat less racist and more nativist one too. And to, see, uh, to help you see why, I'm going to show you some slides, not from January 6th, but from January 5th. January 5th, uh, there was an event called uh, the Jericho March. Uh, and these are a couple of scenes. Um, so you'll see uh, mimicking the biblical Joshua and his Israelite army, uh, the protesters marched around the Capitol singing, praying, and blowing uh, ritual shofars in hopes of retaking their city and, I should add, also of expelling demonic forces from the Capitol and from Democratic leaders. They literally understood themselves to be engaged in spiritual warfare against demonic, demonic forces. Uh, many of the organizers and speakers were part of a loose network of a growing movement of radical Pentecostals called the New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, key leaders of this movement include the late uh, C. Peter Wagner uh, and uh, various apostles such as Che An, Mark Gonzalez, Cindy Jacobs, Doug Sheep, Lance Walnow, T.D. Jakes. Um, Trump's spiritual advisor, Paul White, is also part of this network. And as you may have noticed, um, this is actually a multiracial movement, right? This is not all just white folks. And these are some of the most influential Americans you probably never heard of. They have grabbed the torch of Christian nationalism from this one-time evangelical garden. guardians are taking an even more radical direction. And I want to explain why I see them as much more radical and much more anti-democratic. Um, now, I've already mentioned one of their key doctrines. Uh, this is uh, the doctrine of spiritual warfare, the belief uh, that uh, the sort of battle between the forces of good and evil, that's not something that's going to happen somewhere down the road. That's something that's happening right here, right now, all the time, all around us. And it is the duty of every Christian, at least their sort of Christian, uh, to be constantly combating uh, the forces of evil. Uh, so, you know, you might have this looks like a pocket Bible, but it's actually a holster. And uh, my favorite is over on the right, you know, the kind of sexy, slightly Israeli-looking guy with the shofar holster, right? So you can carry your spiritual weapon anywhere that you go. Um, so the second key doctrine is what's known as the Seven Mountains Mandate. This is one of the most viral memes that you may never have seen. And um, this, is the, this is the view that Christians need to seize control, or they use a biblical language of dominion. They need to seize dominion over the seven societal spheres or mountains of influence, so uh, entertainment, business, education, family, government, media, and, and of course, uh, religion. And that really means by any means necessary, right? Openly, uh, tacitly, democratically, undemocratically. The third doctrine is, oh, well, this is my little, my friend Ross Dowlett. Uh, third doctrine is kingdom now, and this is the view that the second coming of Christ will be triggered by the fulfillment of the Seven Mountains Mandate. In this way, the quest for political power is linked to a yearning for the last judgment and thereby given a heightened urgency. So why wait passively for the end of the world when you can take action right now to help bring it about? So let me say just a few words about the organization of the, the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation. It's not a denomination doesn't have any formal organization. It's, uh, it's a loose network held together by a clerical oligarchy, you know, those folks whose pictures I showed. 
um, doesn't really build congregations. It puts on events, so events like the Reawaken Reawake America rally, and definitely uh, very connected um, with, with the new apostolic reformation. Its leaders don't think of themselves as pastors. They think of themselves as apostles or sometimes as prophets. Um, and um, it's not something that you, it's not a job you can apply for. It's a position that you have to be called to, recruited by somebody who's already a part of this oligarchy. So putting this all together, the NAR combines a radical anti-democratic ideology with a decentralized leadership structure. And in this, it resembles some of the most successful revolutionary moment, movements in tor terrorist organizations of the past and the present. Now, it would be easy to dismiss the NAR and organizations like it as just a ra the radical fringe, but I think it would also be a mistake. That was written in October. Good call, Ross. Um, and we should not repeat this mistake, because if there is one universal law of politics, it's that well-organized minorities can dominate disorganized majorities especially if support for that minority extends into the wider population, which is precisely the situation that we find ourselves in today. So where exactly does this leave us? I see four possible outcomes. One is um, what the late sociologist Pierre Vandenberg called Ehrenvolk democracy, that is master race democracy which he defines as a parliamentary regime in which the exercise of power and the suffrage are restricted, de facto and often de jure, to the dominant group, and in which that group understands itself as a superior race or culture and subjects other races or cultures to varying degrees of legal repression and extra-legal violence. Let's call it Jim Crow 2.0 for short. Another scenario uh, is what we might call nativist democracy, in which native birth replaces racial identity as the basis of citizenship rights and democratic participation. It's not that hard to imagine one of these outcomes should uh, Trump return to the White House in 2024. This is not the only possible scenario, thankfully. There are at least two others. The first is the survival of liberal democracy, which is to say, the status quo ante since the civil rights and voting rights laws of the mid-1960s. The second is the achievement of a multiracial democracy. To say the nation of nations and the people of peoples that Martin Luther King and others before him dreamed of. A democracy in which rights are enforced and extended and historic injustices recognized and perhaps even undone. Which of any of these scenarios will become reality is, of course, hard to say. Historical outcomes are highly contingent, which is why social scientists like myself are so bad at making predictions. But this much is certain. Much will depend on the choices of American Christians and their leaders in the coming years, but also on the choices of secular progressives and their leaders in the coming years. America is at a crossroads. It's been there before, more than once. To the left lies a path towards a multiracial democracy. To the right, a path towards continued white dominance. In the past, America has sometimes turned left for a little while, only to, sheer, to veer sharply back to the right in the end. That's what happened in 1787. That's what happened in 1877 and in 1968, when the United States incorporated slavery into the Constitution, when it turned the South over to Confederate redeemers, when it chose law and order and the war on drugs over civil rights. Each time the country took two steps forward, then one step backward. Which way will America turn this time? The answer will depend on the choices we make in the coming years. Will conservative white Christians be willing to accept their new minority status 
Or will they attempt to cling to power by means of minority rule? Will they choose democracy or power? And what about secular progressives? Will they make room for people of faith and their vision of a multicultural and multiracial democracy? Will they accept religion itself as an element of diversity? Or will they instead fulfill conservatives' worst fears about progressive attacks on religious freedom? For my part, I hope that America will finally take the road towards an inclusive, multiracial, multi-faith democracy. Thank you. We'll now have a time for questions, and since I have the microphone, I'm going to start. <laughs> I, uh, I was struck by part of your book where you mentioned that some, at, at one point when the Tea Party was emerging, that there were a lot of conservative uh, evangelicals who held little booklets of the Constitution in their pockets like they did little Bibles and saw it as divinely inspired. There seems to be a huge gap between that kind of reverence for our Constitution and what happened on January in J January 2020. And I, I just, the 6th or 16th, was it? 6th, I got it right, okay. Um, can you speak to the gap there? Why, why a reverence for the Constitution, almost strange, to uh, pretty much being willing to abandon it? I think they're, they're, it's a great question. Uh, there, there certainly is a lot going on. And wait, it's, it's, the, the question is, why this authoritarian, anti-democratic turn? You know, I mean, you know, where Trump himself talks about, quote, shredding the Constitution. And, um, you know, where you have, you know, some folks, even commentators, you know, Greg, Greg Gutfield just the other day on uh, his show on Fox News talking about, you know, elections don't work. Uh, we need a civil war, right? Um, you know, this is kind of constant escalation uh, uh, of the rhetoric. I mean, you know, some of it is just trolling and clickbait and, you know, trying to, you know, uh, get some liberal tears that you can enjoy. I mean, I, I think that is a little bit of, of what's going on uh, for a lot of folks. But that sort of rhetoric does also create a permission structure for people who are more serious. And, you know, again, I, I just going to reiterate this, you know, all the great revolutions in, in history were made by small minorities of well-organized, well-armed people. Small, small percentage of the population. And that needs to be taken seriously. But, you know, why this turn, right? That's really your question. Um, I mean, I do think it, it partly also does just, it has to do with this, you know, increasing uh, sense of grievance and threat um, that a lot of people, uh, that a lot of people out there feel. And I mean, some of it, I think we have to understand that, you know, some of the anger that people feel is, is justified. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who've lost jobs, lost hope, uh, you know, feel you know, that their communities have been, um, you know, just completely drained and, and leveled, and uh, they're right to be angry about that. But this is where, you know, kind of politicians and media figures who want to point the finger at immigrants or minorities or, you know, somebody else, um, you know, other than the folks who exported their jobs to China or Mexico or wherever, I mean, this is where the, where, where the politics enters in. And I think there is, lastly, just also this, you know, there's a, you know, this, white Christians are a minority in this country now, right? Less than 50% of the population. Um, you know, at the time of the revolution, white Protestants were 98 or 99% of the population. I mean, that is, you know, that is a dramatic shift and that is not easy for folks, uh, for a lot of folks to, to, to accept. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, in the early 20th century in France, there was a philosopher, politician by the name of Maurice Barrez, 
And um, he very much touted Catholicism. He was against separation of church and state in France. But he himself was not particularly religious. He wasn't Catholic. He thought that it would be a means to an end, that it could be used to try to gain other things within society. Don't you think that a good population in this country for the last 70 years um, have consisted of people who have used religion to achieve other ends, political ends, and not just Christianity in other countries as well, too. Absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, and this this is something that's going on both at the at the elite level and at the at the popular level. So, I don't think Trump is a baby Christian. I don't think Trump is any kind of Christian. I think he just figured that this is a group that he needs. And, uh, you know, he kind of focus grouped a bunch of different pitches to that group and found some material that worked and then sort of took that, that show on the road. That's, that's, that's what he did. And, he, you know, there are plenty of other folks like that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there, this is also a, a trick that a lot of white supremacist groups use. Um, you know, it sounds better to say you're defending Judeo-Christian values or Western civilization than to say that you're uh, opposing white genocide or black empowerment, right? So you kind of uh, put on this fig leaf of religion to sort of dress yourself up and hide the nasty bits. And that, I think finally there are, you know, there are, uh, you know, as I pointed out in the talk, there certainly are plenty of folks for you know, for whom, you know, religion really is, Christianity is just a, it's a cultural identity. It's just a way of saying people like us, um, you know, when they think of what is an evangelical, you know, they don't think of, uh, you know, somebody who recently immigrated from Nigeria. They don't think of somebody who recently immigrated from Brazil or uh, Honduras, even though those people probably are much more faithful, much more Christian in any terms than than they are. They think about people who look and think like, like they do. So absolutely, there, there are some people who are just, just using this. And just one quick aside, um, Maurice Ballard's son in the 1920s joined Francis's fascist party by choice. So, um, you know, yep. some of that Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go back here and I'll be with you. Um, I'm really curious about the zero-sum game issue. Um, and it's always puzzled me that in order for me to have, you have to lose in that zero-sum. But I'm also curious as to whether or not what percent of that 70 million people who voted for Trump are white Christian nationalists. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty substantial. You know, if you f if you figure that about a quarter of the population is white Christian nationalists and about half of the population uh, voted for Trump, then you know you wind up with about half of his half of his electorate being motivated by by white Christian nationalism to one degree or another. Uh, I mean, it's clearly not the only thing that's going on. I mean, there's lots of different reasons why. You know what people voted for Trump or voted against Biden. I mean, I, I recognize that, and it is unfortunate that um, we've come increasingly in this period of extreme polarization to feel like, um, to feel to to feel like our politics is a zero sum game. That in order for us to win, somebody else has to lose. I mean, it obviously doesn't have to be that way. But that's certainly the way that it, that it feels right now. Um, and getting back to a place where politics doesn't feel like a zero-sum game, um, I think is really one of the battles that we're in right now. You really make the point that we're at a crossroads between choosing a multicultural democracy and white Christian nationalism, that it's a choice between those two paths. Yep. And obviously you lean toward the multicultural democracy. Absolutely. You know, no, no question about that. I'm going to go here first. Hi. Um, you're a lot more polite than I am. I just don't refer to it as Trumpism. It's just fascism. But my point is that um, 
it takes a lot of money to move public opinion and to organize the, uh, the cells and the religious populations and the people. It takes a lot of money to do that. And that money is coming from a small concentrated group. Uh, are you familiar at all with the book how corporate America created Christian America. Oh, sure. Yeah. And Kevin that Cruz. is a real, seems to be a real prequel to your book, which is how after, as soon as the Second World War was over, those corporations that were taking a lot of money from government realized that now was time to pay the piper, that the unions were going to become more uh, effective that more things are going to socially change. And at the same time, uh, the churches were realizing that we would, there was someone else to provide uh, uh, food and benefits. There was a secular society and a secular uh, group, and that those two groups then came together. Uh, how, how do we reinforce the fact that we have to make contributions to political leaders that we want uh, to move in a more liberal democracy and take us away from what, what mm -hmm. we're seeing right now. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no doubt that one of the other things that ails American democracy right now is the hyper-concentration of wealth and in very few hands, which you know can allow a single or donor, a couple of donors, to effectively become the sugar daddy of a preferred candidate. So, you know, example would be Peter Thiel's sponsorship of J.D. Vance's Senate campaign, right, single-handedly more or less finance J.D. Vance's Senate campaign. And this, you're, this, is, this is a very general problem, but you're right that it also intersects with the problem of, of Christian nationalism, uh, that there has for a long time you know, been a certain group of pastor, cons conservative pastors and a certain group uh, of conservative business people who've been washing each other's hands, you know, who kind of have, have a partnership of sorts. And, I wonder whether that partnership could go on much longer. I mean, the degree of panic amongst the Republican donor class right now about, uh, you know, the Trumpist takeover of the Republican Party and their their apparent inability to do anything to stop that juggernaut. Um, no question about that. Found at the Yale Law School, I'm afraid. Okay, you refer to the Holy Trinity of white Christian nationalism. Yeah. Sounds very much to me like the New World Order. And although what you have listed here, that's the ideology behind it, but they go a little bit further and they talk about concentration camps and putting the people that are undesirable on islands and so on. Do you see a connection between that and the world um, order. Well, I, th I think there are, there are really ex there are political extremists today who are are they fascist or are they fascist adjacent? Uh, I mean, you know, it's like lots of debates that, that have gone on about that, but definitely there are echoes of fascism. You know, sort of ideas that they have about, you know, purges and uh, deportations and, um, you know, using, using police against their enemies and so on and so forth. So, you know, I definitely do worry about I ideas like this that 30 years ago would have been just completely on the fringe. You wouldn't even heard of, of, of them on you know, AM radio at 3 AM, you know, or now things that you can hear routinely on talk radio and, and cable news programs. It's interesting your description of the deep story started in churches like ours 300 years ago. And I, this is a church with the longest history I've ever pastored. And I look back, and there's some parts of the history that I'm embarrassed about. 
I'm, I'm shocked. I read some things that Benjamin Franklin wrote about whiteness recently, and I, it was shocking. But it was, it's interesting, as we move and become a more progressive church, like a lot of mainline churches, that, it, that the, the fundamentalist and evangelical churches have, have taken ownership of the deep story. So we think it's an evangelical thing, but its roots were in our roots, so we need to be a little bit humbled by that and confront it in ourselves as well. Yep. Thank you. Um, in chapter four of your book, uh, Avoiding the Big One, you begin by talking about uh, January 6th insurrection, and um, you say the plume of symbols that was spewed up over the Capitol that day, racist, Christian, and nationalist, was a byproduct of these different forces. And as I was reading that, I believe there were some anti-Semitic symbols also, yeah. and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the connection with white Christian nationalism and anti-Semitism. So this is this my answer. The answer is both simple and complicated. So the the simple part of it is that there um, have always been Christian anti-Semites in the United States. There are still Christian anti-Semites in in the United States. Um, there are also a lot of Christian Zionists in the United States, and their relationship is much more. Complicated. So uh, these are uh, folks who um, think that uh, American Christians and the United States have a kind of a special connection to and a special duty towards uh, toward, towards the state of state of Israel. Uh, you know, people go on pilgrimage and heritage tours to the Holy Land. Uh, you know, like if you ever go visit Jerusalem, you know you'll you're in the hotel lobby and you'll suddenly hear like, is that a southern accent I hear over there, you know? There's big groups, big groups of folks. And their relationship to, is, is much more complicated. And I'll illustrate this with um, uh, an anecdote. This is, uh, I don't know how many of you know Doug Mastriano. Uh, he was, he uh, was a Republican uh, candidate for governor in, in Pennsylvania and like, boy, like, he was like Christian nationalism pure, or seriously, um, you know, all the way. And, uh, you know, he and his wife would campaign together. His wife name is Rebbe, and um, at one point, uh, he, Rebbe was asked a question by, uh, by an Israeli reporter, uh, I think from Haaretz or, you know, one of the, one of the Israeli newspapers. Um, they come back, you know, about their, you know, their stance towards, you know, that there had, he, or Doug Mastriano had said some sort of things. I had pretty, you know, there were some anti-Semitic undertones to what he said. And so she was challenged in this, and she said, you know, I maybe I'm more Jewish than you are. I think we love Israel more than you do. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's just really, this is really, really, it's really, really tricky, and it, it creates a kind of a catch-22 for American Jews, especially progressive or secular American Jews, because um, you're not in Israel, you're in America, so you're like not really a Jew, because real Jews are in Israel. And you don't really love Israel because you're, you, you, you don't really love America because you're a Jew and you belong in Israel, right? So it's just this complete complete catch-22. So I, I think that's kind of the more subtle form of anti-Semitism that I, that I tend to see today. But of course, you're right that the, the really ugly stuff is, is still out there, too. You don't have to look very far for it. Uh, I meant to say that in my knowledge of American politics, that the, dichot the dichotomy and elections that we were all used to, uh, it seems that they they became clearly pronounced uh, way back in the 1948 election, I think, Truman versus Dewey, 
I think ever since then, even though some elections, of course, one candidate or the other had a big landslide occasionally, but I think the, that dichotomy is, I mean, the basic sides really haven't changed that much, um, uh, despite the fact that the United States is way more diverse now than in 1948 and a lot of population shifts in the country, but I think the basic uh, sides have not really changed all that much ever since, I mean, it probably goes further back, but very noticeably starting in that election, I think. Uh, so I'm kind of, I don't know if I'm being pessimistic or maybe you might have a, uh, you don't think the, uh, hopefully the United States isn't doomed to continue in that, this kind of stalemate, the dichotomy, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you. Yeah, it's, 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 it's complicated, uh, you know, and it, there definitely are ways in which some of the, you know, we've been fighting the same old battles for a long time and there are ways in which we're fighting new battles today. But I do have a unicorn for you, which is, <laughs> or a puppy, or a rainbow. Um, uh, some, some hope, you know, some, some sort of getting past this kind of paralysis. The elections in Poland a couple of days ago. So Poland is a, is a country that, you know, where you could see where things in the United States might be headed. I mean, there have been sort of strange parallels in many ways, but. A, you know, very, uh, you know, far-right, populist, authoritarian regime that really took control over the courts, took control over law enforcement, took control over the media, uh, was openly going after political opponents and putting them in jail, um, you know, if anybody, anybody spoke up. And what happened there is a couple of things. So people sort of from the center right to the left got tired of this. They, uh, they turned out in massive numbers. I think it was 76% uh, countrywide. In some places in Warsaw, 99% uh, people voted. That's how tired they were of what was going on. They, um, they challenged the idea that the, uh, that, the, that the authoritarians had that they were the real polls, you know, the, the true polls, and said, no, this isn't what Poland is about. Uh, in fact, you know, Poland, people don't really know this usually, but it has a very deep kind of multi-religious, multicultural history. And people think of it as just, you know, a, a Catholic country, and that's true since World War II, and partly due to the Holocaust, um, and adjustments of borders and other things that happened. But, um, but there, you know, they were able to, to re-embrace that, they were able, uh, to just really to, to you know own a certain kind of uh, Polish Polish patriotism and present a different version uh, of what what Poland could be, and they did the work. Uh, they got organized. They did poll watching. They you know get out the vote efforts. Uh, they were able you know to pull together and overlook some of the differences that they had on policy issues and say look you know. We can disagree about some of these issues later, but first we have to get our democracy back. And they took it back. And so that's, that's the pony, the rainbow, the unicorn for today. A lot of questions. Um, let me go to the back just because there's, I don't want to just give it to the front. You know. Hello, thank you for coming and uh, it was a great talk. Uh, my question is, do you think America with the insurrection on January 6th is moving toward a toxic masculinity in our country? Yeah, so this is, this is, a, this is, a, really, this is a really important question. Uh, um, one, one other thing may I bring into the point that as we developed our history through Christianity or evangelization, as that would seem to, at the point, an understanding of toxicity for ma masculines of over of all others, mm -hmm. so that's the reason why I'm asking. Because this gentleman right there has created something that was. I don't even want to put an answer. Thanks. Go ahead. So there, yeah. de there definitely is. 
something worthy of being called toxic masculinity, but there is also like a real genuine crisis of men, I mean, of young men. Um, and I think, you know, we have to, we have to face up to that. Um, you know, there's a lot of good social science research that's, that's being done on this now of sort of, you know, young men who are falling behind in education, career, um, and that is also something that has to be addressed um, as well. There's another book you refer to in your book with that, a similar, a title that addresses that. It's called Jesus and John Wee. Right. right. <laughs> That's a great title. I wish I thought of that. I, you talked a lot about uh, Christian nationalism as uh, white Christian nationalism as a belief system, but I assume it also has socio-psychological roots and economic roots uh, in terms of who gets attracted to the the belief system? And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about who it is that uh, that that moves towards that belief system and uh, and subscribes to it. So there is work that's being done on that question by psychologists. Um, in fact, there's even a, a book that came out recently called "The Psychology of of, of White Christian Nationalism." But I'm honestly, I, I don't feel really qualified to answer, answer the question. Um, I know there has been debate um, about whether there's some connection to authoritarian personality traits or not, but again, I'm a sociologist and not a psychologist. So it's, it's, it's an important question. I, I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, that there's a lot to be said about that kind of underlying psychology. It's just I don't feel qualified to say terribly much. Sorry to disappoint on that. So I see two more questions. I'm going to let happen because uh, we could keep going, I think, all night, but here we go. <laughs> Given that a few of the core principles of Christianity are empathy and morality, and given that our friend up here is lacking in empathy <laughs> and has no moral compass, when you engage with evangelicals about how they can align themselves with Trump, do they have a different definition of those two characteristics? Yeah, wow. No, okay. I mean, I, mean I've, I, I have, I have engaged. I have tried to engage, and sometimes successfully, but you know, more often, to be honest, unsuccessfully. I mean, the one thing I will say is that I've, I've observed repeatedly is that um, it seems like there's sort of a politics part of some of these folks' brains, and there's like a, you know, everyday life part of these folks' brains, and like. If you broke down by the side of the road, they'd pick you up and drive you to the next gas station. If your, uh, if your mom, if your wife or your partner was sick, they would cook a meal and bring it over to you. I mean, a lot of them are really like at that sort of interpersonal level, at least with people who they think of as like them. They can, you, you really do see, uh, you know, this, this, this kind of compassion. But, you know, the moment it's, people who are different from them, or the moment, really, I think the key thing is just when you're talking about politics and policy, it's like, just like a, like a total split personality. And you know, maybe this is a psychological question. I mean, how that, that comes to be, and this is really just an observation, you know, based on, based on my, my, my interactions. Um, we could tell you where those arguments usually end if you push them, and that is with the topic of with one of the following three topics, gay marriage, uh, transgenderism, or abortion. I mean, those are places where uh, the fo you know, folks feel like they have the moral high ground on you. Um, I like how you point out that a lot of people who claim to be evangelicals aren't, don't even go to church. And it's interesting, I shifted to the UCC from the Evangelical Covenant Church, which was more moderate evangelical. Um, and as a unicorn story, my former congregation I served for 15 years, last weekend, the synagogue right across the street from them had a bomb threat. 
and they had a bar mitzvah scheduled that day. And our church opened the doors of the fellowship hall to welcome the Jewish community in to have their bar mitzvah there. So I, I just, I think the subtleties of the, the truly faithful in some more conservative churches is embraces diversity and doesn't reject it necessarily. But it, it's complicated as you've revealed in you so really many ways. Yeah. Yeah, so there are differences. Yeah, I would just add to that that, you know, I, I think some of the most outspoken, powerful, and effective critics of Christian nationalism have been people who are definitely very theologically conservative. Um, I'm thinking, you know, people whose names you might have heard would be like Peter Wenner of The Atlantic, David French of New York yeah. Times, Russell Moore, who runs Christianity Today, Beth Moore, kind of very famous, no relation, but famous. Uh, female Bible teacher, and there are, there are a lot of people like that whom, whom you haven't heard of, who are just, you know, sometimes quietly, sometimes loudly. But I, th I think it's just, this again, why I really do want to emphasize that, um, you know, just because somebody's a conservative white evangelical doesn't necessarily mean they're a white Christian nationalist, or vice versa, or, vi ver or vice versa. And that, you know, at least in our, our personal dealings, you know, we have to be open, you know, to those moments, you know, and give people, you know, uh, permission to change, evolve. Um. Okay, and last but not least, okay, uh, my question is, how prevalent is Christian nationalism in the military? Is it becoming less or more prevalent with time, and what branches of the military are more prone to this type of mindset? Yeah, that's. I, I wish I could. I wish I could cite uh, really good research on that. Um, I mean, the one thing I can tell you is that um, in and around the Air Force Academy, I mean, that has really been a kind of a pressure point uh, for this for this Christian nationalism. And partly, this is just an accident of geography that you know Colorado Springs has become a kind of a major center. Uh, this is where the Family Research Council is headquartered, for example, and so that geographical proximity is, is part of it, but um, it, it's an excellent question, and I wish uh, journalists, uh, kind of a fearless journalist, would try to, try to figure out the answer, because I don't know. Um, the leadership is not white nationalism. Right. The military. Right, right. Right, right. yeah, I, I worry about the colonels, not the generals. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. It's really been a great night, and I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and a special thanks to Philip. Again, there's some books on the back table. He's glad to sign them or answer questions if you want to walk up. Um, there's also refreshments in the back if you'd like to have a donut or a... There's probably something healthier. I just noticed the donut, so... <laughs> thank you for coming, and... and uh, have a good night.